what is up, everybody, from inside the Indiana Convention Center, right here in Indianapolis, Indiana, the site of the NFL Scouting Combine. This is a live edition, and live in person, you're going to be watching a recording, of Shout, a Buffalo football podcast. And I have with me today a very special guest from CBS Sports. I like to call you a NFL draft expert, analyst, an NFL analyst expert and a bills analyst expert you kind of like you hit every base chris trapasso thank you so much yeah hey man thanks for having me i i try to i don't like to say i'm an expert but i do put in a lot of man hours to watching film being a washington new york guy grew up in a bills fan family so i i love to talk about the entire league certainly the entire draft i'm watching 200 300 guys every year but the bills come first and foremost with analysis with me so before we get started on the football side of things i want to pick your brain and we could have probably talked about this off air, but I think it's kind of cool to promote your brand a little bit. You created a TikTok account, like what now, like over a year ago, yeah. like, right. And it's really starting to blown up. I mean, it was blown up last year. I, th I think I looked at it the other day. It's over 45,000 yeah. followers. Tell me a little bit about why you did that. The platform in general for creating content for, you know, NFL football fans and like, what's kind of different from it? Cause most of us kind of use Twitter, mm -hmm. but I feel like TikTok could maybe be like a Avenue of the future. Yeah. That's a really good question. I actually, I don't want to say I started it out of boredom during the pandemic, but there was a lot of, you know, we had a lot of free time and honestly I got on there. I think just hearing about that, it was kind of this emerging social network and I fell in love with the ability to create content, as we say, right. the ability to stop and start a video, add a voiceover, add text way easier than any of the other social networks that I used. And it's it seems to be that people really love just a quick maybe 30 second to a minute and a half video on draft prospects showing from the all 22 film, even during the NFL season on, say, a, a, a game where Matt Milano really stands out. You show five or six of his plays, give your thoughts on it. That kind of quick, digestible content people really like. And I'm not going to say I was doing anything spectacular. Just the power of TikTok, I think, is definitely here to stay. Um, could post a video that I didn't necessarily put a ton of time into, but again, was maybe showing sometimes a superstar player, Josh Allen's best throws in the game, or someone like Christian Benford that has a really good start to his career, three or four plays that he makes early on. Those videos do really, really well just because the platform itself is so widespread and so powerful. So we're going to get to um, a lot of your draft, uh, you know, thoughts and, mm -hmm. and nuggets, because as the NFL Combine plays out this week, you're going to get to watch a lot of it um, uh, on television. Some of the workouts and, and how the narratives are maybe going to change a little bit. And let's be honest, Chris, a lot of narratives don't change. I mean, we kind of come into this event knowing a lot this this kind of you know, gives that last little push to some prospects and, and, and some others, you know, we'll talk about different things like that, but I want to go back to the, the end of the bill season. Yeah. What happened in Orchard Park against the Cincinnati Bengals? Were you at the game? Yeah. You yeah. were at the game. Yeah, yeah. And so I think both of us watched that game and you could, you could pinpoint like the areas that this team has to address in the off season. We know the situation around Tremaine Edmonds, Jordan Poyer. Now, the cloud that hangs over the the defense as, as a whole, like, and I shouldn't say a cloud, but just like the the questions that that are there, whether or not, yeah, uncertainty about it. Sean McDermott is he going to be the one calling the plays? Are they going to hand it over to somebody else? Where do you kind of prioritize what the Bills need to address this off season, just as we kind of start the process? Well, what was really striking, and Brandon Bean spoke to this earlier in the week, that to don't take too much just from one game, but to me was striking the difference between the makeup of the Cincinnati Bengals and the Bills that in that game, the Bengals were coming off an off season where they spent a ton on their offensive line after Joe Burrow getting sacked um, was a big issue. Um, Jamar Chase, T Higgins, Tyler Boyd uh, spending on the tight end position. Just in that game, the Bills offensive line wasn't very good. Uh, the lack of depth at receiver behind Stefan Diggs when you have the other team that is probably had the best trio of wide receivers in the league. And then you watch further into the playoffs in the Super Bowl, same thing, a, a, a lot more depth at those key positions, offensive line and at the receiver spot. Um, and then certainly the defense, um, the defensive line in that game was not great. Um, but I, I kind of gave a little bit of a pass to the defense in that game because there was no Daquan Jones. They spent half first half of the season without Tredavious White, no Micah Hyde, 
Von Miller gone. You take a team's best pass rusher, their best corner, their best safety. Jordan Poyer was not 100% really all season. Jordan Phillips was playing so well, dealt with that shoulder injury, was probably at 50% for that game. So I think the defense will be okay. There are some free agents that we'll certainly talk about that are kind of looming. But just looking at the Bengals, the Chiefs, and even the Eagles, um, the teams that have gotten farther than the Bills, that have won Super Bowls, or at least gotten to the Super Bowl, it's the depth on offense. It's an offensive-based league, and we saw Josh Allen take a step from maybe a decent starter to an MVP candidate in 2020 when there was Stephon Diggs and Cole Beasley and John Brown and a solid offensive line. The Bills have not really been able to sustain that high level of offensive skill position players and offensive line over the last two years. No, I think that's all really good. And especially the part about like the defense having some built in excuses that maybe the yeah. offense didn't. So let's start at pick 27. I want us from a historical perspective, you've been quite covering the draft over the, over a decade. decade yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, congratulations. First Thank and foremost, you. <laughs> you're a veteran uh, in the game. So as you're looking at that 27th pick historically, you know, we know that, you know, the buzz positions that the Bills fans want, you know, interior offensive linemen. Yep. I mean, I think there's a a, a a smaller portion that maybe even want to look at maybe a tackle, mm. whether that means moving Spencer Brown, putting him on the bench and making him a swing tackle, or maybe a conversation that we couldn't be far too far away from is maybe a Deion Dawkins move inside because mm. you go back and watch that full season. I've been talking to, with a lot of my peers, a lot of colleagues, the drop off from the last eight games of 2021 for Dawkins mm. to the 17 game sample size last season, I think it's kind of more dramatic than anybody really gave credence to. So where is the value going to be at 27? And is, is this the kind of situation as a Bills fan, somebody that's ultra familiar with this team and, and the brand and being billed, is this offense or bust at that position? Or is there a spot that they can go defense and you'd be okay with it? Um, I think it's offense or bust. I think uh, certainly with restructures and stuff that are almost imminent, Josh Allen, maybe Von Miller as well, um, a few other you know vested veterans, they'll have some money, but this is not going to be a time where my normal stock answer would be, well, let's see what happens in free agency. I, I don't think they could add bottom of the roster players, maybe a wide receiver four or five. I think it's got to be wide receiver or interior offensive line, maybe tackle because Spencer Brown didn't really play that well down the stretch in year two. Um, I think also what really bodes well for the Bills, this is not a draft class at wide receiver that has a Jamar Chase or a Garrett Wilson or a Drake London, these entrenched top 10 overall picks. They could be getting the the second or maybe third receiver off the board at 27. So you compare that to what's happened in the past where you'd be picking the fifth or sixth um, wide receiver at 27 overall. And the interior offensive line class, um, I think, is very good. We've had a couple years in a row where it has not been very good. It feels like to me, though, with both of those positions, more so interior offensive line, you can get starters in round two and round three. I, I don't think you necessarily need to pick that player at 27, but we won't know until the actual draft is here. If if I'm wrong or if, if guys run really fast at the receiver spot and we see three or four go off the board before 27, then that maybe forces the issue for interior offensive line. So a couple drafts haven't really aligned very well in terms of this positional strength uh, of late for the Bills. This year, I truly think it does at wide receiver, guard, maybe even center if there's some uncertainty with Mitch Morse's future at center. I can I can live in a world where Brandon Bean takes wide receiver in the in the first round, maybe trades back in the second round a couple picks to pick up another day three pick, and then picks two offensive linemen yeah. on day two. That's that seems like a, a super aggressive approach, but I think they have to be super aggressive. All right, before we get too down 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 the rabbit hole here, let's start with wide receiver because I think at twenty seven it's a, it's a fun conversation because I think dream kit dream scenario. Some type of situation that's probably gonna, you know, have to work with a with a trade up just because of the position. Jordan Addison is probably a pipe dream, but it's one that I think Bills fans would love if there's somehow that he fell to them. Like there's a lot of things that he could do. Then I feel like there's that second pocket of like um, uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, mm -hmm. maybe Zay Flowers in the mix there. Who do you really like? And is there anybody like off the radar? that maybe, maybe out of the first round that people aren't talking about that could slip into the first round? Yeah, I have a lot um, because I've certainly gone deep into the wide receiver class already. Um, with Jordan Addison, it does seem like a pipe dream just watching the film, but and certainly all the listeners want to certainly turn tune into the wide receiver workouts. There's a chance that Jordan Addison is going to be a little smaller and lighter than people think, and if he doesn't run – 
if you look back at the history of first round wide receivers, even late first round wide receivers, you got to run pretty close to four five zero, if not under that. You probably want to be in the four fours. If he's right at, you know, four four nine, four five zero, four five one, he doesn't look insanely fast like a true burner. And the first round's all about traits, or a vast majority of it is about traits. He could be there. It could be Quentin Johnston. It could be um, Zay Flowers could run in the you know high four threes, little four fours. I think at wide receiver and corner, you will hear it during the broadcast with with Daniel Jeremiah, and it's true. Those two spots very contingent where they go on how they work out the vertical, the explosion, which just makes sense because those positions, unlike a lot of others, offensive line, defensive line, you're running in a straight line forty yards down the field. You need to be able to be explosive, be able to change directions in a hurry, um, and just be fast downfield. Um, so those wide receivers, I think. A few won't be there, but it, it's good for Bills fans and shout listeners to familiarize yourself with Jackson Smith and the Jigba from Ohio State, Zay Flowers from Boston College, and Johnston even mm-hmm. from TCU. A few names who I really like, and I'll be specific with this because, and I asked Brandon Bean this on Tuesday, the Bills need to get better after the catch. Mm-hmm. They have, they were 32nd in the league yards after the catch per reception in 2021. This past year, they talked about it in the offseason and said, hey, let's get better in that area. They were 31st. <laughs> you look at, I mentioned earlier, the Eagles, the Chiefs, the Bengals, all inside the top seven in yards after the catch per reception. I, I think the Chiefs led the league in overall yak, not taking anything away from Patrick Mahomes, but it, it was it's a lot easier when Josh Allen could throw a five-yard pass that turns into a 30-yard gain as opposed to having to fit it through tight windows. Jaden Reed from Michigan State truly reminds me, it just in terms of the whole picture of him as a prospect, of Stephon Diggs. Stephon Diggs was a big recruit. His sophomore season at Maryland was very good. Not quite as good in his junior year. Same exact deal with Jaden Reed. Last year at Michigan State, it felt like this is going to be a first rounder. The quarterback play, the offensive line wasn't as good, but you saw him beat press at the line consistently. And he was really good at the Senior Bowl, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, he's right around Stephon Diggs' size, like 5'11, 190. Very nuanced route runner, head fakes, shoulder fakes, works well with his hands, and he plays like he's like six foot three. He is great in contested catch situations, and most importantly, gives you that suddenness, the contact balance after the catch. He might be available in the third round, where if the Bills maybe needed to address linebacker, if there's something that happens with Tremaine Edmonds or safety earlier, um, that they could pick Jaden Reed probably later. The other guy that I really like that probably will be available the same portion of the draft Parker Washington from Penn State you're gonna get I don't think he's quite Debo Samuel but you're gonna hear those Debo Samuel comparisons he's like six foot over 200 pounds so he's got that stocky build watch the Ohio State film don't watch his highlights watch the Ohio State game he showed everything you want out of that high-end yards after the catch wide receiver two bounced off a bunch of tacklers guys who are gonna ultimately be in the NFL at Ohio State made a lot of tough catches in traffic, took hits. I don't think you want to draft him in the first round and say, hey, you're our number one. But if you say you're not going to get as much attention because of Stephon Diggs, Parker Washington is kind of the wide receiver with his build and his yards after the catch strength that the Bills really have not had in this Brandon Bean, Josh Allen, Sean McDermott era. So those two I really, really like. There's one guy that they want to just be down the field, Jalen Hyatt um, from Tennessee, is going to run incredibly fast, could be even in the high four twos. Um, doesn't give a lot after the catch, but to really spread the defense vertically, they can certainly do that a little bit with Gabe Davis and Diggs. He's a name that probably will be there at 27 unless he runs crazy fast. So, again, there's three or four outliers right now or, or, or guys outside um, of the general radar that will be available at the receiver spot for Buffalo. So again, it bodes well that even if you're a little disappointed that the Bills don't go wide receiver, say, at 27, there will still be some good players available on day two. We've seen it. A.J. Brown, Debo Samuel, Terry McLaurin, D.K. Metcalf, all second and third round picks who have evolved into big time players at the position. I like it. We've got, we got some homework, which I, I really like to watch. the know. Ohio State game for Parker Washington. All right, very good. Interior offensive line, uh, the two names that everybody's talking about, uh, Osiris Torrance, Steve Avila, Avila, with some position flexibility, more yeah. so maybe for Avila. Can he play yeah. center? Center, yes. Okay. So, so obviously those are two names. Again, though, the value at 27 for interior offensive line, it's always going to be a question. If they're a day one plug-and-play starter, 
I understand it more, and I, and, and I almost would give that a better grade. But here's the thing with Brandon Bean. I think he likes bringing in offensive linemen that have versatility and let it, like, play out. And mm-hmm. to me, that approach, it it bodes more well more so for let's take some guys later in the yeah, draft. Yep. Come in here, we'll develop them, we'll work them out, and then we'll fit the pieces where we need to along with some other free agents who are some, I guess, just – you know what Aaron Cromer likes to do. You know the kind of players that fit traditionally in his offensive lines. What do you think are the players that Bills fans should know about on the interior line? Yeah, that's a really good point because I think what you were getting at is if you're going to pick someone in the first round, you have to have an exact plan for him. And it seems like the Bills, like you mentioned. They don't ever have exact yeah, plans for anybody exactly. outside of Josh Allen. So, so that's why I certainly think that Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott understand and just the rest of the Bills scouting department that – bettering the offensive line is a huge priority, maybe priority one or two um, this offseason for Buffalo. There's a lot of names, those two that that you referenced, Osiris Torrance and Steve Avila, will be kind of the two that will be discussed the most to maybe be first-rounders. I think they're more early day two guys, Mm -hmm. which maybe you say, hey, look, we need offensive line on the interior, and the Bills just say we're just going to reach a little bit. Because I think with Osiris Torrance, he's not a crazy athlete. He's like 6'3", 340, huge hands, right? huge hands, long arms, anchoring ability for days. But Aaron Cromer likes to get his offensive lineman on the move a little bit with that zone blocking scheme. He certainly mixes it up. But I think he does prioritize athleticism a little bit more. Avila can play inside or out. He's a big dude as well. Um I think, though, because he's a little bit more mobile, he's better at the second level as a run blocker, and certainly the Bills' run blocking could get better. Um, he seems to be more of an Aaron Cromer fit, which maybe that would be receiver in, in round one, offensive lineman in round two. Jarrett Patterson from Notre Dame is someone who's been on the draft radar for a while because he's one of those – he's not Quentin Nelson, but he's one of those longtime Notre Dame starters that he played from like his freshman year on, played center, played guard. He kind of fits what the Bills – philosophically like um, needs to get stronger, but from a um, athleticism standpoint, I think he's exactly what Aaron Cromer likes and probably would be available in the third round. Now, offensive lineman, believe it or not, I just said that it's not key about the 40 yard dash and the vertical, but their workouts matter. And I think teams factor that in the bills have a pretty robust analytics department. It will kind of depend on how Jared Patterson tests with his agility drills, the broad jump, things like that. So those are, the names that that really interest me along the offensive line. If they want to go center, John Michael Schmitz from Minnesota, uh, over, I think, 2,500 career snaps, which is crazy. Um, Joe Tipman from Wisconsin is a name to watch during the workouts. Also, he's tall, so he could play guard. Super athletic in terms of footwork. He was probably the most mobile center in this draft class, not quite as experienced. Um, and then Olu uh, Oluwatimi. From Michigan, kind of hard to say that name. Not a big-time mover, but is NFL-ready when it comes to his power and his strength. Um, Doesn't really feel exactly like what Aaron Cromer likes, but is probably someone that could maybe play guard in a pinch or just be your day-one starting center. And I think the Bills have to plan for the future at the center spot, given Mitch Morse's uh, concussion history and his age at this point. I'm here with uh, Chris Trapasso uh, inside the Indiana Convention Center at the NFL Scouting Combine. Uh, exciting first few days. We're going to really get to you know watch these these players perform and compete uh, over the next couple. Um, I want to flip the script uh, in this last segment and talk a little bit about the defense because it's the great unknown right now. Yeah. We don't know necessarily in the draft what the Bills are going to necessarily need, and and maybe that pushes them to be a little bit more dramatic. You know. Sean McDermott, he's got a big voice in that room when they're drafting, and he's a defensive guy by trade. And I think one of the reasons they've they've veered defense so often is because you know he he's got he's got like you know plans for guys or at least best laid plans. It doesn't always work out. Okay, so the Bills need a, need a new interior offensive or middle linebacker. Mm-hmm. They need a new safety. Let's just say both guys are gone. Give me two or three names at each spot and a draft range that you think makes sense for what the Bills historically want to do and maybe what the Bills could do now with Al Holcomb in the mix, uh, Joe Dana now at safeties coach. Uh, who are some names that you're kind of looking at? Yeah, I think if you really want to dive deep into the draft and, and be ready for the, 
three days in late April where the Bills are going to make really important picks. You do have to think about linebacker and safety. Um, we'll get certainly more clarity on on the Poyer and Eden situation. But I think even if they re-sign Jordan Poyer, which seems somewhat of a long shot at this point, given DeMar Hamlin's uncertain future, Micah Hyde coming back from a pretty serious injury in his age, um, they need to add more pieces to the safety spot regardless. Um, but I'll start with linebacker. There's two guys who really stand out to me. Jack Campbell from Iowa, he's not going to test through the roof. He doesn't look like a, a high-caliber, twitchy athlete, but he's about Tremaine Edmonds' size. He's like 6'4", 6'5", um, 240-plus pounds, and he gets the most out of his athleticism. For someone like Edmonds, who's grown into a really good coverage linebacker, it's taken him time, though, being as young as he was and and as inexperienced as he was, Jack Campbell's like a three, four year starter at Iowa um, who is very good in coverage already. I think he is that three down player. And because he's not going to test very well, um, will probably be there at least into the second round, probably into the third round. Another name, Diane Henley um, from Washington state has a background that feels like the bills would gravitate toward. He started his career at Nevada as a wide receiver played on the perimeter they actually moved him to slot receiver at Nevada, transfers to Washington State, and first starts at safety, free safety, then strong safety. His last season, he plays linebacker and is absolutely lights out. He's 6'2", 6'3", 230-plus pounds, played middle linebacker, um, feels like someone that will test well, could be maybe a second or a third-round pick. And if Tremaine Edmonds is gone, that's suddenly a knee that needs to be filled with maybe an early draft selection. Um, in terms of safety, there's two guys um, kind of off. I don't want to say off the radar, but not being talked about a ton. Um, Jair Brown from Penn state feels like Jordan Poyer on the field. Like I wrote in my scouting grade book, his comp being Jordan Poyer, that he is cerebral. He's twitchy. He plays in the box really well, but then you see him step out and play free safety and make plays on the football ranging from the deep middle, um, relatively often. And Kayvon uh, Merriweather from Iowa is another one. And with the Micah Hyde connection, I think they like those Iowa players, Ike Butker, um, AJ, Epinesa. AJ Epinesa. I was, yeah, I was trying to think. I was like, there's definitely more than that. I think they like that program and how well coached they are with Kirk Ferentz there. Um, Kayvon Merriweather, not going to test very well, but he is long. He's always around the football. I don't want to say he feels like Micah Hyde, but Micah Hyde didn't test through the roof, and it was all about his instincts and understanding where he needed to be on the field. Kayvon Merriweather um, is just the latest in a long line of Iowa safeties that plays a lot better than you would look at his – his combine workout and say, this is probably not a high caliber player, but he's always around the football beats blocks. Well, can play in the slot. Really that versatile safety that I think the bills like. Um, so you piqued my interest with Jack Campbell. I'm going to do a deep dive on him because I, the one linebacker that I did get a chance to look at is Henley. And to me, he maybe looks more like maybe if the bills were to resign Edmonds, like, the Matt Milano mm, yep. replacement plan, if that makes yep. sense. It, is that more kind of like his fit? Yeah, I mean, he played in the middle, but because of his athleticism and the fact that he's a little smaller, I think that weak side or strong side, like outside linebacker role is probably where some teams will have him. I think he can play in the middle and take on blocks, but definitely need to watch Jack Campbell because he is a old school middle linebacker all day, very adept at beating blocks to get to the football in the run game. Like I mentioned, I think changing directions, it's not, you're not wowed by that, but then you see him with his hands on the football a lot in coverage, had a bunch of interceptions, pass breakups. So if he was doing that and not being a crazy athlete, you put him in this Sean McDermott system that is very conducive, I think, to production from the linebacker spot. Suddenly losing Tremaine Edmonds, if that happens, doesn't feel as bad because again, this is a kind of the opposite of Tremaine Edmonds where he's an older prospect that has thousands of snaps at Iowa, very well coached program. Um, I, I think he would make sense, especially if the Bills like to have that dichotomy between the, the speed and the quickness of Milano, who's smaller, and then your linebacker being this kind of tower in the middle of the defense. I got to get you out of here. Remind me, I'm going to have you on again uh, after we get out of here. Uh, be, uh, not, maybe not next week, the week after as we kind of get into March and you know, uh, probably maybe right after free agency because yeah, we can good. reset the yep. board. It's a good idea. And here's the thing with it too. We got to talk about Terrell Bernard because I think we got some really good 
insight into Sean McDermott's continued like belief in him and like obsession I, almost. It is almost an obsession. <laughs> like I, I wouldn't surprise me if they just run him out at middle linebacker if Edmonds leaves. I mean, he, he he seems to think he can do it, but that's for another day. I want to give you about thirty seconds to a minute here. Let everybody know where they can find your work. Uh, about the scouting grade book a little bit and anything you want to plug. Yeah, so for the next couple of days here as the combine gets going with the on-field workouts, which we're all waiting for. I mean, this media yeah. blitz at the beginning of the week is fun, but I, I love to get the numbers and like like see how these guys are testing. I'll be doing the um, CBS Sports live blog um, along with my colleague Josh Edwards, just reacting in real time, kind of old school live blog um, over the next – three or four days throughout the weekend. And with the scouting grade book, it's just, I, I created a system in my Google sheets of a way for me to be able to stack my big board. Cause it was way too hard to just plug in players at different positions and say, well, how do I put this safety ahead of this wide receiver? Um, it's customizable. Um, the big board builds itself as you grade. There's uh, weighted categories. If you want to dive deep, you don't have to maybe watch 300 guys like I do. Um, but if you want to, you could use any grading scale you want. Um, or you just want to watch like the top 30 or 50 players. So you kind of have on Bill's big board. Um, it's available in the link in my bio on TikTok, on Twitter, um, $30. It will help you if you do any kind of scouting yourself. The scouting grade book has made my life significantly easier. It'll certainly help you as well. Chris Chapasso, CBS Sports. Make sure you check him out on all the social media platforms. Thank you so much for watching Shot. We'll be back tomorrow with Brian Talbot uh, as we continue to cover uh, the combine here in Indy. Take care, everybody.